I'm going to talk a little bit about the patellofemoral joint in primary total knee arthroplasty. Um, a big thanks to AO Recon for organizing this. Really an international faculty uh, of, of which I am the smallest. I'm so thankful to be participating with these, um, these other presenters. Really brilliant brilliant talks. These are my disclosures. I'm a consultant for Stryker. I have equity stake in a surgery center. I sit on the editorial board of uh, several uh, English journals. So patellofemoral tracking is really the, 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 the holy grail for success. And it was really this article, one of the first articles that I think began to start to shape our minds on, on how to address the patellofemoral joint. This is obviously John Insall's work. Knees put in uh, in 93 and 94, some were in Varus, some were in Valgus. We're obviously better at those techniques now. Uh, no resurfaced patella exceeded the native thickness. This was the conventional teaching. There was a, a 3% lateral release rate, but still some had anterior knee pain, 7% had pain with stairs, and some had uh, painless crepitance. So uh, how do we address it today? What are the modern techniques and how do we get there if it really is the holy grail? And so I wanted to, you know, kind of go through that. First, it takes a good approach. It's really important that we can see what we need to see, appropriate size incision, want to minimize soft tissue. Uh, I think more and more in my practice, I've understood external rotation of the tibia to decrease tension on the patellar tendon uh, ligament. We know that distal resection is important. You know, before we can talk about the patella itself, we have to talk about what are the keys to success for patellofemoral mechanics. So alignment and particularly flexion and extension of the distal femoral cut. Now that can be very hard to control. We know from uh, engineering studies that the quadricep vector is so important and it's around this spherical axis, but how do we hit our target? Well, this is what we know, a, a more practical paper showing that the sagittal position of the knee correlates to anterior knee pain. And anterior knee pain actually is increased with extension of the femur, okay, relative extension. So we're putting a hard metal rod with our our manual techniques into the femur, relatively extending the distal femur, increasing anterior knee pain. It, uh, anterior knee pain increases if we have anterior offset, uh, if our ratio is higher, and I'll show you that in a bit, and even with the tibial cut. So, so to understand why people have kneecap pain after knee replacement, it's not always just the patella. Here's really the explanation. It's an excellent study looking at posterior condylar offset and posterior tibial slope. And essentially what they did is they looked at these forces in this model, contact forces at the patellofemoral joint in a PS knee, uh, just like we were discussing, to see what changes the posterior collar offset and posterior tibial slope had on the, uh, the, the, the overall pressure on the patella. This is what uh, the, the, the modeling looked like. And you, so you can see how the implants were growing in the anterior posterior and the slope was changing on the tibial side. They found contact stresses on the patella decreased with increasing the posterior condylar offset and increasing the tibial slope. Now you gotta be careful not to increase the posterior tibial slope too much because then you run into flexion and stability. But you start to see the position of your components and overall alignment in the knee, how critical that is to how much force is through the kneecap and anterior knee pain. This is the graphic representation of anterior femoral offset, which must be minimized. You can see the example on the right, which is good position, and the importance of measuring posterior condylar offset. I encourage you to start being very critical of your technique and looking at your x-rays when you see people with anterior knee pain. It's not always just the patella. And now we've got to figure out how to rotate. Now, some guys do white side lines, like you'll see on, on the right using bony landmarks. Other guys are using a tension device and flexion to try to get that rectangular space. We heard a brilliant talk earlier about trying to, 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 to get these gaps right in valgus knees, but really every knee, right, we want to make sure that we match it well. So there are various techniques there, but how do you rotate your tibial component? Do you use fixed landmarks? Do you float it? Personally, I float it, take it through a range of motion, mark it, and then set it. Uh, but these techniques uh, uh, can be different from manufacturer to manufacturer because they're symmetric versus asymmetric uh, tibias, which have to be taken into account. Often asymmetric tibias, the tendency is to over externally rotate, so be careful of that. We know tibial component rotation can lead to post-operative extension deficit because it's not respecting this screw hole mechanism. Well, that keeps pressure on the patella. That keeps pressure in the patellofemoral articulation along the kneecap, causing knee pain and stiffness. This is a real challenge. This is a case uh, from 
Guo, uh, Guo Chen Li. I give him full credit for this. These are preoperative x-rays. Intraoperatively, you can see the internal rotation of the tibia. Um, this went on to revision. You can see how he's nicely externally rotated, also changed the uh, femoral position, and that patient ended up doing quite well. So, so if it's a talk about the patellofemoral joint, we have to at some point talk about the patella. So here you go. Do we resurface or do we not, right? That is the question. And believe it or not, the debate continues. This is a uh, analysis uh, uh, of the randomized controlled trials. This is in 2019, so very up-to-date research. There were 20 articles that were included. In, in, and this is really the, 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 the summary. If we don't resurface the patella, and I wish I knew all the countries we're talking to today, I wish I knew what the tendency was in each country, but here in the U.S., uh, we tend to be resurfacers. But what these, this study, study show was there's an increased revision rate if the patella is not resurfaced. Nonetheless, the debate continues. This is Australian registry, which again says higher revision rates if the patella is unresurfaced, uh, slightly lower if it's an inlay, or the lowest revision rate with an onlay patella. Despite all of this, uh, patellar surfacing does come with a cost. And this is why some of us uh, no doubt move away. There are complications and we'll go through several of them here. First of all, it's technically demanding. This is a, a picture from the literature showing isolated resurfacing in the medial facet. That is unintentional and could potentially cause a, ca cause a real problem. This is periprosthetic patellar fracture. We'll talk here in a little bit about the risk factors, including patellar thickness, osteoporosis, and trauma. Uh, the treatment's really based on the the, the, the function of the patient. You may look at that x-ray and say, oh my goodness, that, that x-ray is horrible. But the, if the extensor mechanism is intact, you may not operate on this patient instead immobilize. If the extensor mechanism is disrupted, obviously that often leads uh, to surgery and we have to consider the implant stability. And, and what about surgeon uh, uh, factors, right? So we talk a lot about the patient and how thick or thin their bone is, but what about what can the surgeon affect? This is a great, fairly recent study uh, out of my fellowship institution that looked at factors leading to complications following uh, knee, uh, patellar resurfacing. So 10 millimeter uh, uh, increase in thickness only led to three degrees loss of motion. So this concept of overstuffing the patella is perhaps not the big concern that we once thought it was. There was no difference in the fracture risk with the residual patella less than 12 or more than 12, but there was significant increased fracture, fracture risk if the pre-resection patellar thickness was 18. So in these patients in particular, we need to be careful when we're resurfacing. So it's what the patient brings to us we have to be thoughtful of. Now, patellar dislocation and subluxation is obviously an issue. It's tempting. I have some sports colleagues that always want to consider an MPFL reconstruction. This is rarely a soft tissue solution. Uh, a really careful evaluation with CT of the component position is important. If you find this, there are salvage techniques. I include this uh, just for completion. I've never done the gold wing reconstruction of the patella, but if there's insufficient patellar bone, this is uh, described, and I'd encourage you to uh, look this up in the literature and have it in your armamentarium. There is patellar clunk, which is essentially car scar tissue around the patella, particularly in PS designs that can happen. The treatment here is arthroscopic debridement has a fairly low recurrence rate. So it, it, are, are you tempted to elect not to resurface based on the complications? Well, a couple of slides about that. If you're going to not resurface, you should really consider denervating the patella. This is well described uh, in, in many papers. This is one prospective randomized study. Uh, you need to be fairly aggressive in your denervation procedure. Again, this is well documented in the literature. I put in the chat, by the way, a link to my OneDrive account that has uh, these articles to describe the specific technique. But denervation of the patella, very important uh, if you're going to uh, save the patella. Also, if you elect not to resurface, you should uh, consider um, facetectomy, lateral facetectomy for improved position. The technique is well described uh, by Nunley at a wash U. Essentially, you leave the lateral facet and you go on to resect the bone laterally. You cut with a saw, you mark it here, he's showing you, cut with a saw and then remove the lateral facet. This is what the x-ray looks like. This improves tracking and there's good uh, follow-up data on this. My personal patella resurfacing technique in my last 20 seconds, I resurface them all, I trim the osteophytes, I breathe the synovium, I measure the native patellar thickness. Use two towel clips. It's, this is a freehand cut for me down to 12 millimeter thickness medium, uh, a minimum. 
uh, I use a symmetric button, I medialize the component. You can see here I'm marking the lateral border. I perform a limited lateral facetectomy and I submit in most cases. Interestingly, cementless failed for reasons that can be addressed by design. And so I have started to use some cementless patellar components. Nonetheless, make sure you're tracking well. What is the summary? Handling the patella at the time of primary knee is critical for outcome. You need to optimize femoral and tibial positions. If you're not gonna resurface, so without patella resurfing, resurfacing, it requires careful te technique. If you do resurface, it still requires careful technique. Good luck, my friends. It's a pleasure to be with you. Again, the uh, articles are in the uh, chat box. Thank you.